Chapters 9 through 11 of Book 1 of Les Miserables, Volume 5 by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables, Volume 5 by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabelle Florence Hepgood. Book 1 The War Between Four Walls. Chapters 9 through 11. Chapter 9 Employment of the old talents of a poacher and that infallible marksmanship which influenced the condemnation of 1796. Opinions were exchanged in the barricade. The firing from the gun was about to begin again. Against that grape shot, they could not hold out a quarter of an hour longer. It was absolutely necessary to deaden the blows. Enjolras issued this command. We must place a mattress there. We have none, said Combeferre. The wounded are lying on them. Jean Valjean, who was seated apart on a stone post at the corner of the tavern with his gun between his knees, had, up to that moment, taken no part in anything that was going on. He did not appear to hear the combatants saying around him, Here is a gun that is doing nothing. At the order issued by Enjolras, he rose. It will be remembered that on the arrival of the rabble in the Rue de la Chanvrerie, an old woman, foreseeing the bullets, had placed her mattress in front of her window. This window, an attic window, was on the roof of a six-story house situated a little beyond the barricade. The mattress, placed crosswise, supported at the bottom on two poles for drying linen, was upheld at the top by two ropes, which, at that distance, looked like two threads, and which were attached to two nails planted in the window frames. These ropes were distinctly visible, like hairs against the sky. "'Can someone lend me a double-barreled rifle?' said Jean Valjean. Enjolras, who had just reloaded his, handed it to him. Jean Valjean took aim at the attic window and fired. One of the mattress ropes was cut. The mattress now hung by one thread only. Jean Valjean fired the second charge. The second rope lashed the panes of the attic window. The mattress slipped between the two poles and fell into the street. The barricade applauded. All voices cried, Here is a mattress! Yes, said Combeferre, but who will go and fetch it? The mattress had, in fact, fallen outside the barricade between besiegers and besieged. Now, the death of the sergeant of artillery having exasperated the troop, the soldiers had for several minutes been lying flat on their stomachs behind the line of paving stones which they had erected, and, in order to supply the forced silence of the peace, which was quiet while its service was in course of reorganization, they had opened fire on the barricade. The insurgents did not reply to this musketry in order to spare their ammunition. The fusillade broke against the barricade, but the street which it filled was terrible. Jean Valjean stepped out of the cut, entered the street, traversed the storm of bullets, walked up to the mattress, hoisted it upon his back, and returned to the barricade. He placed the mattress in the cut with his own hands. He fixed it there against the wall in such a manner that the artillery men should not see it. That done, they awaited the next discharge of grape shot. It was not long in coming. The cannon vomited forth its package of buckshot with a roar, but there was no rebound. The effect which they had foreseen had been attained. The barricade was saved. Citizen, said Enjolras to Jean Valjean, the Republic thanks you. Bossuet admired and laughed. He exclaimed, It is immoral that a mattress should have so much power. Triumph of that which yields over that which strikes with lightning. But never mind, glory to the mattress which annuls a cannon. End of Book One, Chapter Nine. 
Chapter 10 Dawn At that moment Cosette awoke. Her chamber was narrow, neat, unobtrusive, with a long sash window facing the east on the back courtyard of the house. Cosette knew nothing of what was going on in Paris. She had not been there on the preceding evening, and she had already retired to her chamber when Toussaint had said, It appears that there is a row. Cosette had slept only a few hours, but soundly. She had had sweet dreams, which possibly arose from the fact that her little bed was very white. Someone who was Marius had appeared to her in the light. She awoke with the sun in her eyes, which at first produced on her the effect of being a continuation of her dream. Her first thought on emerging from this dream was a smiling one. Cosette felt herself thoroughly reassured. Like Jean Valjean, she had, a few hours previously, passed through that reaction of the soul which absolutely will not hear of unhappiness. She began to cherish hope with all her might, without knowing why. Then she felt a pang at her heart. It was three days since she had seen Marius, but she said to herself that he must have received her letter, that he knew where she was, and that he was so clever that he would find means of reaching her, and that certainly today, and perhaps that very morning, it was broad daylight, but the rays of light were very horizontal. She thought that it was very early, but that she must rise nevertheless in order to receive Marius. She felt that she could not live without Marius, and that consequently that was sufficient, and that Marius would come. No objection was valid. All this was certain. It was monstrous enough already to have suffered for three days. Marius absent three days. This was horrible on the part of the good God. Now this cruel teasing from on high had been gone through with. Marius was about to arrive, and he would bring good news. Youth is made thus. It quickly dries its eyes. It finds sorrow useless and does not accept it. Youth is the smile of the future in the presence of an unknown quantity, which is itself. It is natural to it to be happy. It seems as though its respiration were made of hope. Moreover, Cosette could not remember what Marius had said to her on the subject of this absence which was to last only one day, and what explanation of it he had given her. Every one has noticed with what nimbleness a coin which one has dropped on the ground rolls away and hides, and with what art it renders itself undiscoverable. There are thoughts which play us the same trick. They nestle away in a corner of our brain. That is the end of them. They are lost. It is impossible to lay the memory on them. Cosette was somewhat vexed at the useless little effort made by her memory. She told herself that it was very naughty and very wicked of her to have forgotten the words uttered by Marius. She sprang out of bed and accomplished the two ablutions of soul and body her prayers, and her toilette. One may, in any case of exigency, introduce the reader into a nuptial chamber, not into a virginal chamber. Verse would hardly venture it, prose must not. It is the interior of a flower that is not yet unfolded. It is whiteness in the dark. It is the private cell of a closed lily, which must not be gazed upon by man so long as the sun has not gazed upon it. Woman in the bud is sacred, that innocent bud which opens, that adorable half-nudity which is afraid of itself, that white foot which takes refuge in a slipper, that throat which veils itself before a mirror as though a mirror were an eye. 
that chemise which makes haste to rise up and conceal the shoulder for a creaking bit of furniture or a passing vehicle those cords tied those clasps fastened those laces drawn those tremors those shivers of cold and modesty that exquisite affright in every movement that almost winged uneasiness where there is no cause for alarm the successive phases of dressing as charming as the clouds of dawn it is not fitting that all this should be narrated and it is too much to have even called attention to it the eye of man must be more religious in the presence of the rising of a young girl than in the presence of the rising of a star the possibility of hurting should inspire an augmentation of respect the down on the peach the bloom on the plum the radiated crystal of the snow the wing of the butterfly powdered with feathers are coarse compared to that chastity which does not even know that it is chaste. The young girl is only the flash of a dream, and is not yet a statue. Her bedchamber is hidden in the somber part of the ideal. The indiscreet touch of a glance brutalizes this vague penumbra. Here, contemplation is profanation. We shall, therefore, show nothing of that sweet little flutter of Cosette's rising. An oriental tale relates how the rose was made white by God, but that Adam looked upon her when she was unfolding, and she was ashamed and turned crimson. We are of the number who fall speechless in the presence of young girls and flowers, since we think them worthy of veneration cosette dressed herself very hastily combed and dressed her hair which was a very simple matter in those days when women did not swell out their curls and bands with cushions and puffs and did not put crinoline in their locks then she opened the window and cast her eyes around in every direction hoping to descry some bit of the street an angle of the house an edge of pavement so that she might be able to watch for marius there but no view of the outside was to be had the back court was surrounded by tolerably high walls and the outlook was only on several gardens cosette pronounced these gardens hideous for the first time in her life she found flowers ugly the smallest scrap of the gutter of the street would have met her wishes better. She decided to gaze at the sky as though she thought that Marius might come from that quarter. All at once she burst into tears. Not that this was fickleness of soul, but hopes cut in twain by dejection. That was her case. She had a confused consciousness of something horrible thoughts were rife in the air in fact she told herself that she was not sure of anything that to withdraw herself from sight was to be lost and the idea that marius could return to her from heaven appeared to her no longer charming but mournful then as is the nature of these clouds calm returned to her and hope in a sort of unconscious smile which yet indicated trust in god every one in the house was still asleep a country like silence reigned not a shutter had been opened the porter's lodge was closed toussaint had not risen and cosette naturally thought that her father was asleep she must have suffered much and she must have still been suffering greatly for she said to herself that her father had been unkind but she counted on marius the eclipse of such a light was decidedly impossible now and then she heard sharp shocks in the distance and she said it is odd that people should be opening and shutting their carriage gates so early they were the reports of the cannon battering the barricade. 
A few feet below Cosette's window, in the ancient and perfectly black cornice of the wall, there was a martin's nest. The curve of this nest formed a little projection beyond the cornice, so that from above it was possible to look into this little paradise. The mother was there, spreading her wings like a fan over her brood. The father fluttered about, flew away, then came back, bearing in his beak food and kisses. The dawning day gilded this happy thing. The great law, multiply, lay there smiling in August, and that sweet mystery unfolded in the glory of the morning. Cosette, with her hair in the sunlight, her soul absorbed in chimeras, illumined by love within and by the dawn without, bent over mechanically, and almost without daring to avow to herself that she was thinking at the same time of Marius, began to gaze at these birds, at this family, at that male and female, that mother and her little ones, with the profound trouble which a nest produces on a virgin. End of Book One Chapter 10 Chapter 11 The Shot Which Misses Nothing and Kills No One The assailant's fire continued. Musketry and grape shot alternated, but without committing great ravages, to tell the truth. The top alone of the Corinth facade suffered. The window on the first floor and the attic window in the roof riddled with buckshot and biscayans were slowly losing their shape the combatants who had been posted there had been obliged to withdraw however this is according to the tactics of barricades to fire for a long while in order to exhaust the insurgents ammunition if they commit the mistake of replying when it is perceived from the slackening of their fire that they have no more powder and ball the assault is made Enjolras had not fallen into this trap. The barricade did not reply. At every discharge by platoons, Gavroche puffed out his cheek with his tongue, a sign of supreme disdain. Good for you, said he. Rip up the cloth. We want some lint. Courfeyrac called the grape shot to order for the little effect which it produced and said to the cannon, You are growing diffuse, my good fellow. One gets puzzled in battle as at a ball. It is probable that this silence on the part of the redoubt began to render the besiegers uneasy, and to make them fear some unexpected incident, and that they felt the necessity of getting a clear view behind that heap of paving stones, and of knowing what was going on behind that impassable wall which received blows without retorting. The insurgents suddenly perceived a helmet glittering in the sun on a neighboring roof. A fireman had placed his back against a tall chimney and seemed to be acting as sentinel. His glance fell directly down into the barricade. "'There is an embarrassing watcher,' said Enjolras. Jean Valjean had returned Enjolras' rifle, but he had his own gun." Without saying a word, he took aim at the fireman, and a second later the helmet, smashed by a bullet, rattled noisily into the street. The terrified soldier made haste to disappear. A second observer took his place. This one was an officer. Jean Valjean, who had reloaded his gun, took aim at the newcomer, and sent the officer's cask to join the soldiers. The officer did not persist and retired speedily. This time the warning was understood. No one made his appearance thereafter on that roof, and the idea of spying on the barricade was abandoned. Why did you not kill the man, Bossuet? asked Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean made no reply. End of Book One, Chapters 9 through 11.